Well, hello there. Good afternoon. Good evening. Welcome to the latest of the Spitfire sessions. There's no cricket going on at the moment. There are no forums going on at the moment. But together with Spitfire, Shep and Liam, Kent Cricket are bringing the forums, bringing Kent Cricket to you. And tonight, we're having a little trip down a reminiscence road. We've got three players who are very much key part, or were a key part, still are, I suppose, of the Kent Spitfires, who recently celebrated their 21st birthday. These forums, you know, all about opening up the club, doing what we can with the wider community. At the moment, you know, we've got the Kent and Canterbury Hospital right next door. Thank you to all of you for joining us here tonight. I'm Steve Watts, I should be your host. Three very special guests to introduce to you tonight. So without any further mucking about, let's crack on and bring you our panel first up, a man who was recently a finalist in a poll to find the Kent supporters' favourite wicketkeeper of 150 years of Kent cricket, a 2007-2020 Cup winner, a 2005 Ashes winner, a one-day international cricket for the country of his birth as well, Papua New Guinea, a Kent player for over 10 years. A very good afternoon to Gerard Jones. How are you? Good evening all. Oh, I'm very good, thank you. A bit frazzled after a day at home trying to educate the kids and do schoolwork myself. So, um, but yeah, no, all good, thanks. Good, great for you to join us tonight. Uh, let's introduce our second panellist for the next 45 minutes or so. Kent's highest ever wicket taker in T20 cricket. Uh, the latest Kent player to have captained England. That was back in 2013. Another 2007-2020 Cup winner, James Trebrell played two tests and 45 ODIs for England, spending his entire county career with Kent. It's a very good evening, Shredders. James Trebrell, hello. Hello. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, obviously, a pleasure to be here tonight. So, thanks, thanks for having me and uh, look forward to a good chat with uh, some good friends. It's a delight, Treaders, to have you in my living room. It really is. Uh, the third and final, but by no means least, panellist to introduce to you is Martin Saggers. Three test matches for England in his career. Norwich Union League winner back in 2001 against Spitfire as part of the victorious 2007 squad. You, of course, know these days Martin Saggers better as an umpire. I've uh, been officiating since 2012, it says it's saying. Is that correct? It's a long time ago now. Well, I started in 2010. Uh, I was on the reserve list for a couple of years, but yeah, on the first class panel since 2012. Okay, thank you. Now, thank you very much for sending in your advanced questions. Later on, we're going to find out uh, which of those advanced questions the panel have decided is their favourite. And before we get into uh, a whole load of questions, actually, folks, so thank you for sending those over. Uh, you have the chance as well to send them during this webinar, I think it's called, God knows. I want to speak to Geraint Jones, first of all. You were very late to join us here because you're such a busy boy these days. What's going on? Yeah, sorry. I had a meeting at school. Actually, I'm just having a look. We've got 105 participants. That's the first 100 I've brought up for a while. So, yeah. you know, all of us lads, put your back. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, I've been at school work today, so I had a had a meeting that kept me in until well, I had left it early actually. So yeah, got the school stuff, um, got fire fire service as well. Actually, I'll come on on call at seven tonight, so I'll have to have a bit of a shave and uh, get ready for the beeper to go off. And uh, at the same time, trying to do a university course. Got a uh, got something to hand in Thursday night, so uh, yeah. I don't know what I'm doing to myself, to be honest. What university course is this? What you're studying? Business and sports management. So final year of it. Um, it's been it's been tough, you know, it's very tough, but uh, but worthwhile. So it's um, you know it's been going over the last sort of four years. So yeah, in the final stretch now. You know, a whole load of people at the moment are furloughed. It was two months ago, I'd never heard of the word furloughed, mm -hmm. and now it's absolutely everywhere. I'm virtually unemployed at the moment. You seemingly are busier than ever. Yeah, well, to be honest, I've just come off furlough myself with school. Um, you know, I was being an independent school. It's like a, it's like a business. So Thursday, uh, it was the last day of my three weeks of furlough. So uh, I had a bit of understanding, like you have, of, of what it's like. But, um, but yeah, I've with with the fire service stuff and now school back being live les lessons like this, dialing in and trying to see how 20 odd 
students are, are getting on with lessons. It's um, everyone's on a learning curve at the moment. I think it's uh, it's it's strange times and. Uh, you know, with kids at home having to try and educate them as well. It's, um, you know, everyone's, everyone's sort of doing it tough. But, um, but yeah, I, I managed to get out. So I've been out on a few calls with the fire service. Um, you know, that's got me out of the house a few times. But, uh, but yeah, I'm, I am busy. Um, but I enjoy everything I do. And Treaders, you now are well into the, well down the path, aren't you, of the, the career after being a professional cricketer umpiring how's that going at the moment obviously right now not a lot but uh, in general yeah well i sort of you know i've got two paths open currently i'm sort of coaching and umpiring sort of side by side and seeing which one sort of comes out on top really um obviously there's a bit more of a, a path to get to a, sort of where sagsy is now at the, at the top of the game so you've got to do something else to pay some of the bills as well so um, I'm currently at a, a private school, so, so I'm at Eastbourne College uh, down in Sussex, which, you know, one of those. It's uh, obviously a neighbouring county, so we've done about that. We've got a few, we have got a few Kent Young players in there, though, so that's all right. Um, so I'm doing a bit down there a couple of days a week. I still do a fair bit of coaching with the county through the <coughs> academy stuff and the age groups. Um, and then, obviously, during the summer months, I'm, I'm then sort of turning my hand to the to the umpiring and stuff. So, uh, standing in the Kent League and um, a little bit of second team and, and what is now called National Counties um, Cricket, which uh, was my first year last year and I thoroughly enjoyed it. So, um, just sort of got to wait and see, see which one sort of pans out and does the best for me, really. And Sagas, we don't need to ask you about your career post playing we see you on the tv far more than we ever did probably when you were playing Get um, the there is a well. question that's coming on these parts. <laughs> an advanced question coming in would you ever consider being an umpire that's one for you i presume in retrospect so well i mean my decision was i decided quite early on uh, whilst i was still playing it was i think it was back in 2003 i spoke to a couple of the umpires um, and they suggested that I I have a look at it, and so I did my level one, and then over the next few years I, I I went down that route and did level two and three, and it was just a natural progression for me. I always wanted to stay within the game, and it was just nice to sort of stay involved straight away. And you know, you kind of there's it's one thing knowing the laws of cricket, but it's another thing knowing the game. And having played the game for so many years, it does help. Um, and when you try and make that transition into being an umpire you know you know the game and uh, you know what some of the players are trying to do to you know to, to try and cheat the law as, as it were um so it's just it was just good for me to still be involved in the game and it, it's gone well for me since i want to get your view on this actually as a professional umpire i'm sure you've watched with interest the football season which was brought to an abrupt end hopefully gets going again fairly soon var it seems to have been the most horrendous mess. I'm sure you've watched on with interest. Did cricket back in the day, it's a long time ago now, when it introduced technology, did, did we in cricket get things a lot more right than they are in football? I think so, yeah. I mean, I think with football, it's a totally different game in terms of it's, 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 it's more or less non-stop. Whereas with cricket, you get the natural breaks within the, within the game. So you can have those referrals, reviews, um, and... Uh, in football, it's not necessarily those sort of things that I think football's got wrong. It's the fact that one millimetre offside, that cannot be right. You know, they, they haven't looked into the, the full ins and outs of, of using VAR with the laws of the game. Um, whether they should have, you know, taken, say, a particular point of the body rather than just the trailing leg or, or whatever. So, you know, there's a lot of work to be done with VAR, as we've all seen. But I'm sure they'll get it right in the future. All right, let's get into the first of our uh, advanced questions here. Sam has sent this one over. Uh, one for all three of you. Your proudest moment in a Kent shirt. Uh, Garrett, we'll start with you on this one. I'm sure that 2007-2020 Cup victory must be right up there for you. Yeah, that's it. I've been having a look at the, the questions as well as been going on, and it was uh, Frank, who I remember a lot from my time at, uh, at the county ground with his boys. Uh, he asked me that one, and um, yeah, absolutely. That, that T20 win was was incredible for us and uh you know to be able to do that that's what we that's ultimately why you play is to is to win trophies and uh 
you know, we had a, an amazing side for a couple of years there. And, and so that was our opportunity and, and to get through and go all the way and uh, to win that trophy. Uh, good celebrations that night. Did you see the uh, 21st birthday celebrations over the Easter weekend? A lot of people were asked to give their view on which overseas player who wore a Spitfire shirt made the greatest contribution or had the biggest impact. Did you give a view on that? Um, well, was, well, you know, if I think about my my era, the overseas players, uh, really blessed to 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 play with some incredible ones. Um, you know, I didn't quite see the inter- were Colpac, were they were they included or not? I'm not sure. I think we're pro- talking proper overseas here. Proper overseas. But you can you can, inc- you can include the Colpac for, for this conversation. Yeah, well, that's, we had so many in our side. You know, I wouldn't have anyone else to talk about, to be honest. But. Uh, <laughs> Um, obviously, Martin Van Jarsfeld was uh, amazing slip catcher and the runs that he scored and uh, the professionalism that he, he showed. He, he, he's one that straight away comes to mind. Um, but then, you know, when I talk through the overseas players, I was lucky in my first season in 2003 to have the second half of it play with, with Murley. Um, you know, what, he, what individually he did for that side, well, I think we were second from bottom and he, he nearly got us to right to the top um, playing in incidentally he wasn't playing in whites he played in greys because he uh, he washed he washed his whites with with the colours early on so for the rest of the season I thought silvers he was uh, in silvers so um, you know that, but just his you know to be able to play with the leading wicket taker of all time was was pretty special so he and especially me as a keeper so he he stands out for me as the the overseas player that I you know in my time made made an incredible impact but then you know just before me was Andrew Simmons and a little bit of it uh, so Simo was was right up there as well so really lucky Steve War was uh, I was in the second team but I was, I was able to watch his his first innings under lights at Canterbury so you know this we've been really lucky at Kent with the overseas players we've had some real legends of the game come along and uh, you know and to be able to sit in the dressing room and and listen to them and then walk out on the field and it's been pretty special. Trevor, same question for you. Overseas players in a Spitfire shirt. Proudest moment uh, in, in a Spitfire shirt yourself? Yeah, um, well, look, I think 2007, when really, you win a trophy, that uh, sort of stands in your memory, doesn't it? I think, I think you go through your career and sort of the proudest moment sort of evolves as it goes. I think, you know, when you make your debut, you know, you make your first sort of um, match-winning performance, I guess. Um, maybe get your cap. Those things all, all follow through. But I think the real ones are when you win competitions. So probably the 2007 and then having played quite a big part in the promotion in 2009, that was, that was a pretty, personally, that was quite a proud um, season, really. Um, to obviously get back where we felt we belonged and, um, and to have played a pivotal part in that personally was was a, a very proud thing um so those two really are probably the main ones going back to that period sort of 2006 to 2008 9 um we probably should have had more days like that for honest with the side that we had um you know we were blessed really from 1 to 11 it turned out that we'd all i think all 11 in that that period played international cricket and i think all at one stage we had 11 players in our Championship side that had scored first class hundreds. I mean that was a cent- that was a sign of the side that we had at that point. Um, we probably didn't quite get over the line as much as we should, to be honest. Um, you know, many reasons for that, and you know, I won't go into that now. But uh, that period was was a quite a special one to be involved in, I guess. Um, overseas players. Um, I won't say Murley because I only played the first half of the season there when we were second from bottom. So, um, yeah, I didn't see a great deal of him in the crossover. Uh, but I can get over that with him being the highest test wicket taker and sort of let him have that one. Um, Simo for me was one that, you know, I was lucky to be, I was 12th man actually when you spoke about the 2001 uh, win in the Norwich Union. Um, Watching that game to win that tournament, um, he was immense. You know, if he didn't get runs, he would take a wonderful catch, get an individual run out, bowl an unbelievable spell. 
if there was a game where he wasn't involved in one way, shape, or form, it would be an absolute <clears throat> shock. You know, he was he was a fabulous cricketer. Um, learned a few things about how to manage yourself off the field from him as well. Um, but yeah, he, he was a, he was a magnificent cricketer all round. Jonesy mentioned some of the other names, but he's one that really stands out. Certainly in the early part of my career, of someone. I thought, well, this is what it's really about. And Martin Sagan, same question for you. Same two questions for you, if you could give us answers to both of those, please. Yeah, I think I think the guys have mentioned most of the names. Um, Andrew Simons, for me, I played a lot of cricket with him. And to see what he can give uh, on the cricket field and, and in the dressing room as well. He's such a huge character. You know, you, you know what you're going to get from him. And as Treddy says, if it's not, not runs, it's wickets. And if it's neither of them, then he's involved in the field and he gets some amazing run outs or catches out in the deep. Um, some of the one day innings he's made, I think he made a hundred at uh, Tunbridge Wells one year, you know, off not many balls. Um, but going back to some of the other overseas players that I was lucky to play alongside, um, Steve Waugh was one of my highlights. Uh, I remember watching him, obviously, getting so many runs for Australia and averaging over 100 uh, in the Test Series. Um, but to play alongside him, um, that was at the time when I was sort of peaking as well. And, you know, he, he sort of offered me a lot of advice. But Raul Dravid was also one back in 2000, my, uh, my first full year. And to see him face Shane Warne, who was top of his game at the time. Um, and he, he just made it look so easy. We were chasing down just over 200, I think. And um, Raul Dravid just got 100 with ease. Didn't look in any trouble at all with the ball on day four, turning square. Um, but yeah, it, it been some great players over the years to have played for Kent. And I, I personally feel lucky to have played along, alongside them. Um, my proudest moment, we've mentioned it, 2001 uh, uh, National League. Again, you know what Jonas says, winning trophies is what it's all about. Um, and for me to win, that was my first trophy that I won. So that was, you know, special in itself. The 2007 trophy, I was there, um, but unfortunately I was on the bench. So uh, it, it didn't quite, you know, feature much in my, my his, history as a Kent player. So it was 2001 National League. Interesting so, uh, to hear what you said there about Andrew Simons. Was it at Moat Park, the very early days of T20? Was it any of the most destructive inning? Thing I've ever seen. It seems a long time ago now playing at Maidstone. But I'm fascinated to hear you say as well what he brought off the pitch because he was quite colourful in the dressing room, wasn't he? You don't have to give too many details, but it's an interesting character. Absolutely. Well, he didn't mix his words anyway. Um, <laughs> a typical Australian, he, he told you as it was and you, you made sure you listened. All right, let's crack on to our next question. This one's come from uh, Nigel. Looking back in your careers, all three of you uh, playing for Kent, we'll start with you, Gary. What advice? Would you give to your younger self now if you were starting over in, well, I was going to say 2021, I don't have any cricket, but if you're starting your career next season, what, what advice would you give yourself, Garan? Um, to be honest, I, you know, from, just from a personal point of view, was to probably uh, in, enjoy it and remember it more. I probably was a bit self-absorbed in, in the, you know, I was a, in the training side of it. It probably comes from not trusting my ability enough uh so i you know i'd spent hours and hours and it probably uh it flowed to after after the, the day's play i'd think about it a lot and whereas actually i'd look back and i'd think right yeah i, I love i loved it but um probably wish i had sort of engaged in the whole you know, we talked about simo and you know the off off the field stuff you know it's pretty renowned what he's what he would do but um probably more so that just you know, I've gone through my career and I played, you know, top level and in, and it's probably more that uh, enjoyment of it and, and celebrate a bit more. And, um, but yeah, so, you know, you've got the usuals of, you know, I, I trained pretty hard. So that's, that's a given to get to the level that we all got to, you, you can't get there without training hard. And, um, and, and to be able to play the length that we all played, uh, you have to you know, train well and, and and train hard and look after yourself physically and and and, and we all did that so uh, for me it was just more of the, the whole package of uh, you you do get a bit absorbed in the fact you're playing professional cricket and you want to perform to your absolute best and for me I probably got a bit too absorbed in that 
um, and I actually wish I'd let my hair down a bit more. All right, Travis, just before you answer that question, I've got a little bit of housekeeping here to say, um, if you want to ask a question, you're watching this, use the gallery view and use the Q&A function if you want to fire a question over uh, before chucking out time at quarter past six. And if you use the gallery view, you can see the panel, all of us, maybe you can see all the panel at the same time. And Treaders, you're next with that same question. What advice for your younger self? Um, yeah, I think Jones is now get there, really. I think, um, you know, everyone would say sort of work hard, do that. But I think if you truly love the, what you're doing, then that, that comes naturally. I think um, for me, I think it would be as part of that training, try and be a bit smarter. I probably wasted a lot of time just doing, doing, doing lots and lots and lots as opposed to doing the right things. Um, so it would probably be training smarter, working out exactly what I needed to work on, getting it done and then moving on, as opposed to just keep repeating the same same again, which made me quite good at those skills, but maybe I could have experimented, you know, got out of that box a little bit quicker and onto other things. Um, so probably being a bit smarter with my practice is probably the, the best one. You've got to think of the G in your front room, Fred. It is some bird singing. Well, yeah, I've got the door open. It's a lovely afternoon, isn't it? <laughs> I was going to say, Steve, just with Trinity's talking there, probably from our era is what we came through most was the innovation and the fearless cricket. You know, since we've all played, what we see players willing to do now, stick their head down on the ball and sweep it. Sam Billings, when he came along, you know, and started playing those shots. And that for me is probably, yeah, going, just thinking about it, going back was to in, tr get more heavily involved in innovating shots and, and becoming a fearless player for the white ball cricket because uh, the game very quickly progressed in that and I probably felt a bit behind with that. Just a little follow up to that question. You talk about, about Sam Billings. You know, these days, several county sides do this. England certainly do have about 50 <laughs> wicket keepers in the squad, um, which means that, of course, we see them out in the field. Are you astounded by the level of fielding of the guys who normally are keeping wicket for their counties when they're on international duty? No, we're all like that. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, you know, as a. As a as a keeper, you you love you know you the, the lads are there probably saying I've got the chance to field I I'd throw myself into it and 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 really sort of enjoy it and but yeah you're right it is still remarkable uh, Bilbo is an exceptional athlete and I think as as wicket keepers you you generally have to be very athletic to be able to do it so naturally going out in the field and you've 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 got well I talked about fear before about the batting your fear as a fielder is taken away because you're quite prepared to dive and to, to try and make that incredible catch or to stop the boundary. Yeah. I remember my, in my debut down at Somerset in 2001, I did a piece of fielding where I chased the ball to the boundary and I, I ended up doing a somersault, landing on my feet, running back in. And, but it was just natural as a keeper. You know, the throw-in wasn't very good, but the actual bit of work I thought was amazing. But, uh, but keepers, you've got that lack of fear in the field and you just it's a bit of a novelty and so when it's a novelty you throw yourself into it you're willing to try anything and and that's what i see with the keepers out there but uh of this current era they are as well you throw johnny bairstow into that he's an unbelievable fielder uh you know joss butler so all the keepers now are incredible athletes and so going out into the field is it's it's easy for them it's natural i think that goes for every position though doesn't it now i think you know, when we first started, uh, you probably had two or three in every team that needed to field in certain positions because they perhaps were not as mobile as some others. But now you look through from one to 11, everyone's an athlete. They can all field, they can all dive, they've all got gun arms, they can all throw. Um, so it goes through from whether you're a spinner, keeper, fast bowler. I mean, you see what some of the fast bowlers do, running around the boundary, diving, full length. I mean... Not saying Sags didn't do that, but perhaps when we were starting, it was less common than it is now. Right, he'd get, he'd get the old arms going off. He'd go, okay, <laughs> the arms, <laughs> well, I was just going to actually, well, I was going to come on to that. I was going to ask Martin, we haven't even got to you, Sags, yet. 
asking about what you advice you give to your former self when you're starting out. But come on in, as the trainers has raised this, the fast bowler, the opening bowler, one of your quicks, fielding. Come on, these days you've got to be a top fielder. One to eleven, you have well, to. Well, when you fielder. when you've got a gun arm, you don't need to get there so quick. So you just pick it up and just <laughs> just wang it straight over the top of the stumps and uh, and get a run out that way. Jonah's going to be there to take it for you as well. So. No, it's, it, things have moved on a lot. I mean, um, yeah, I did used to field on the boundary because I did have quite a, quite a good arm. But, um, you know, you still throw yourself about, obviously. Um, but going back to the, uh, the, the previous question, I think for me, it's a, it's a bit opposite than the other two because, my, you know, I, I started um, up in Durham. Um, but before that, I was, I was from Norfolk. So we didn't actually have too much in the way of training and growing up and understanding what a cricketer needed. So for me, the mindset wasn't as, as, as good for, for going down the gym as both Treddy and Jonah would, uh, would know very well. I wasn't a very good trainer. You know, I hated running and I wasn't very good at going down to the gym. Um, I was one of the old school where I just wanted a bowl and there's nothing better to get fit, bowling fit by bowling. And I think that's, that's what, kept me going you know it was was just constantly bowling and playing day in day out you almost didn't need to go to the training during the season it, it's more the off season i didn't i probably didn't do enough off season training right here's one for you actually sagas now um one that's been sent in here uh by william who says do you enjoy being the third umpire the tv umpire in any game would you rather be out in the middle? I think it probably answers itself that question. But what's your view? Um, well, I think I think we've seen that there's more and more going on for the third umpire. It's now more and more difficult for the third umpire. Um, when that pressure's on, you know, you're sitting in the box and then you get a review sent up to you. Your, your heart just just starts racing, thinking, you know, it's now over to you to make that decision. I think being on field, um, when you've got cameras, you know you've got that backup of. Um, the third umpire up in the box. So if you, if you get a close run out or a stumping, then you've got to send it up because your your eye is not good enough to see it in real time. Um, that, that's what the cameras are there for, to make that decision, that, that close judgment call. But, you know, if, if it's so obvious, you know, you don't want to be sending things like that up because it's only going to stop the flow of the game as well. But um, I think we'll see more and more coming in for, for third umpires. And it, it could even become a specialist a job in itself. Very interesting. Do you, when you're out in the middle uh, and a TV game, an LBW decision, whichever way you've given it, and you see the player doing that, does the old heart race a bit? <laughs> well, to be honest, we haven't got that far yet um, with, with player reviews. We haven't had that in the county um, set up. Um, it's going to be introduced for the 100 ball, where, whether that starts this year or next year. Um, so, yeah, I've been speaking to some of the international guys and they say, you know, you, 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 your heart sinks when you, when you get the, uh, the call that you've got it wrong. And, you know, you've, you've just got to be able to deal with that and move on because no matter what's happened in the past, you've got to concentrate on the next delivery and try and get that one right as well. Fred, as you're sort of coming through these umpiring ranks as we speak, is the, being the third umpire, is that now a, a, a specialist part of the, of the umpiring that you go through before you get to the circuit? Uh, well, I haven't got to that point yet. Uh, the games I'm doing uh, aren't fortunate enough to be on TV yet. Hopefully we get to that point. But um, yeah, I'm guessing that as you go through and you get closer to doing that, then some part of the training involved um, gets you sort of prepared for that. So hopefully I'll get to that point. But um, at the moment, I guess it's... Um, you know, it's all part of the progression, really. If you um, if you're showing good things on the field, then you know those good things will sort of carry on into the box as well. Um, but clearly, there's a um, technique behind it. You've got to understand how it all works and uh, the protocol behind it, and um, put it into practice, really. And that's the thing about umpiring that I've enjoyed, really, is like Sadie said, there is about the concentrating on the next ball and sort of the processes involved. It's very much like what we used to do as players, really. It's, and I guess that's why a lot of players go into it in that, you know, if you're batting for a long period, you have to you have to do that. You, same with bowling during a spell, you're concentrating 
you've been hit for four of the previous four, you've got to land the next one on a good line of length. And it goes the same for umpiring, really. And it's a lot of the men, same mental sort of processes. Got one sent in here, Gerard, which is for you. Um, it's the quickest bowler that he ever kept to. And I suppose whoever that is, how far back to the boundary did you have to stand? Uh, he's in view. Surely he's in view and they're with you now. Mohamed Sami, he bowled uh, probably, imagine it, uh, I think it was at, uh, it was at uh, Maidstone playing against Knotts. Um, Peterson was playing for Knotts, uh, and it was on a you know a pretty lively wicket, and and that was up with one of the quickest spells I felt I kept to. Uh, he was for a thin little guy, whippy action was was unbelievable, and the pace that he was able to generate from that um, was it was incredible. Interesting to watch him come round the wicket and be in KP. Um, so you know that that livens stuff up a bit, but uh, so probably in a Kent shirt. Yeah, Mo Sammy would be up there. Uh, and then, you know, England-wise, yeah, those guys I happen to play with, um, Harmy, Freddie, Simon Jones, they were all all of a similar sort of pace. Uh, different styles, but the pace was was rapid. I, you know, some close to the 30-yard circle on, on regular occasions, um, flapping about, trying to trying to touch leg side balls. But, um, but all good fun. I loved it. You know, when... when when you're in that position where you've got a fast bowler tearing in and you, you know, you're the person with the gloves on, it's up to you to catch everything, stop everything, but also to watch the fear in the batsman. You know, that's, that was, that was exciting to, to sit, to know the pace that was coming down. and think, right, he's got to deal with this. Uh, so yeah, Mohammed Sami at Maidstone against Nottingham. I seem to remember Jason Gallion got a brilliant hundred in the second innings for not, we still won the game. I think um, Sammy got 15 wickets in the match. Yeah. We played. I don't think he got a wicket. I did in the two previous. I think we played at Chelmsford and the Oval the two games before that. And I don't think he got a wicket. And then because um, Nasser Hussain got 200 at Chelmsford in his first game, and then Mark Butcher I think got 100 at the Oval, and then he got 15 in the game at um, at Maidstone. Um, and I'll never forget it, it stood at slip for a long period and Jason Gallion, I remember, got a brilliant hundred in the second innings. Like I say, it's a horrible wicket to face pace on and he played brilliantly, I seem to remember. We obviously won the game, but um, it's funny how the things stick in your mind, isn't it? Yeah. Fast bowler and fast driver. He used to say some of the story where he would drive and what pace he would go was frightening. So he obviously was uh, someone that liked to do things quickly all the time. Well, Garant's mentioned keeping wicket to Mohamed Sami. Dread is your slip. What's it like being in the cord from someone that quick? Is that actually easy? Does it just come to you and it's all instinct? Yeah, well, some, well it's not necessarily instinct because you're that far back. Actually, you probably have more time than you think. Actually, standing three, well, five yards away from Darren Stevens, um, who can still, you know, bowling 70 mile an hour or whatever, is probably harder because you've got less reaction time and standing that far, that far back, yes, it comes hard and fast at you, but actually you've got time. It, so it does take that little bit longer to get to you, although it's coming at pace. So, it, like I say, it's, it's a nice place to view from until they nick it. We're, Steve, we're cricketers. Less time to think, the better. We're not scientists, we're cricketers. Well, you're not getting us out of this corona mess then. Um, as well, you both mentioned Maidstone and uh, Mohamed Sami there bowling at that particular venue at Mopar. We'll come to Martin Sagers. There's a question that's been sent in while we've been talking here about favourite outgrounds. Sadly, there is no Mopar in terms of Kent cricket these days. Um, Sagers, we'll come to you on this one. Favourite outgrounds. I suppose you could choose one for Kent. There won't be loads to choose from. And uh, around the rest of the country. And, and you can throw in where you like to umpire as well at the outgrounds, if you like. Yeah, well, obviously Tunbridge Wells. You know, when 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 everything's out in bloom, it just looks perfect. You know, um, but as you say, there's not many outgrounds that um, that you play at nowadays. It's not like back in the seventies where you know you, you you played at Dartford and Folkestone and, and Dover. It's um, you know most crickets now are played at uh, 
Well, it's basically either St Lawrence, Beckenham or um, Tunbridge Wells. I don't think they're back at Moat Park yet. Um, but ar- ar- around the um, around the country, I mean, there's some fantastic venues, um, and it, it does take a lot to put on at an outground. But I think again, you know, one of the one of the favourite ones for me is Arundel. When there's, you know, it's got the bank on one side and it's packed, um, traditional wooden sort of pavilion, you know, high up looking down over the field. Um, and obviously you've got the Arundel Castle just, just over the brow of the hill. So it's, you know, it's a great spot when anywhere is nice when it's bright and sunny. So it's, um, you know, and for, for me, a non outground, you know, it's the home of cricket, Lords. Everybody wants to play there, watch there, umpire there, and be involved in a final there. Gerard, in your um, Gloucestershire days, do you play down at Cheltenham? I mean, that was, that was, I've never been to Cheltenham. It's a fantastic reputation. Yeah, um, I answered this in the in the Q and A one. Uh, someone put the p- question, and I did say Cheltenham, and um, obviously been lucky to play there both sides, home and away, uh, and see what it meant to the Gloucester fans, the Gloucester members. Um, you know, I put in the in my answer as as well about. Uh, Brendan Nash got an amazing 199 not out to pretty much get us over the line, but then he had to retire hurt with cramp as we, I think we were about a dozen runs short and out walked Charlie Shrek. We thought this is impossible. We chased 400 in the day and Shrek, he nonchalantly just whacked it and there we go. And uh, I ended up having to drive Nashy back because he's still suffering from cramp. So I had to drive his car back when uh, it would have been nice to have a few beers to celebrate. But um, yeah, Cheltenham, uh, is an, that was that's probably my favourite one out out ground from other counties, um, just because yeah, being able to play there from, for Kent and for for Gloucester. And Treaders, if your bowling slow is, I'm particularly thinking of the white ball, but let's say T20. Some of these out grounds aren't very big. Some of these boundaries are they? No, well, some of the main grounds aren't now. They bring the boundaries right in, don't they? Um, yeah, no, they, and that's part of it, isn't it? Now is the sixes and fours is 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 the main thing people come to see. It's certainly the twenty twenty. So you've got to be a bit smart of how you don't get hit for those too often. But yeah, someone like Uxbridge was always quite horrible because generally middle of the summer the outfield's brown, so it flies across the ground and is about forty yard boundary straight back over your head. So uh, well, everywhere, but straight was even shorter as so it seems so um and a good pitch so somewhere like that was always not a very nice place to go but you always generally knew that you if you did go around the park you weren't going to be the only one no that's true uh, another question that's come in while we've been speaking here um for all of you are you are you in contact with uh, any of the players that you you play with over the years and the staff at the spitfire ground are you are you regular followers still of kent cricket Scarrett? I just add to that actually. I was in, uh, I said I, I desperately try not to speak to that bloke that runs a shop. Can't remember his name, but he's always a pest and I always wants stuff. So, uh, no. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, yeah, no. Um, That's the bloke that well, runs a shop. Then no. Barry, yeah, no. I I try to. Obviously, life's busy, so um, getting in to watch matches is is difficult. But I do try and get along to a few days and uh, speak to the guys. Uh, I do keep a bit of an eye eye on what's going on. Um, you know, I, I see Treddy, Treddy a lot of Sundays. He's, he's Sunday roast, obviously uh, part of the family. So uh, yeah, you just you bump into guys along around the place. Um, Dave Fulton, see him a bit. Yeah, so it's it's one of those ones where yeah, you end up just in random places bumping into one of the guys and end up having a chat. But um, I, I do enjoy getting along to the ground and. And, and trying to watch a bit of cricket. I went to some T20s last year with some of the staff from school and, and had a great night out. I do, you know, I probably don't go enough. You know, I, I want to go more. So, fingers crossed, we do get the chance to to all go up there and watch something this year. And Sagas, if you're obviously following Ken, what's it like umpiring against your old county? <laughs> well, I've got to sit on the fence, haven't I, now? So, yeah. uh, but, uh, you know, obviously being involved in cricket and, and being an umpire, you, you bump into people all the time, uh, ex-colleagues or people that you've played a lot of cricket against. Um, a lot of them have turned into, you know, becoming coaches for their particular counties. So you're always, you know, seeing people that you used to play play alongside. Um, talking of 
Dave Fulton, he lives four doors away from me. Um, I've been trying to move for years, but I can't get away. So uh, um, we're always bumping into each other. The old round of golf with a, with a few of the ex-players. And um, we had a good reunion up at the cathedral the other the other month. So that was good to see a lot of the guys. Dean Headley um, had a good few drinks with him afterwards. I didn't get a word in Edgeway, as usual. But, uh, you know, it's always good to get, you know, the old players together. Um, and it's one thing that Kent does well is is the old past players days. So, you know, the more people that come to that, you know, it's, it's great that we can we can chat and reminisce about, you know, our playing days. Same one for you, Treaders. And if you could follow that up, because uh, someone has asked us here, uh, let me just scroll across, it was Dominic, who wanted to know about your dad's influence on your career. Yeah, um, on the first one, um, yeah, I'm still a little bit involved, I guess. I'm still doing a bit of the academy and sort of age group stuff. So I'm in the ground relatively regularly. So I see quite a few people quite often. Um, so that's quite nice. Sort of having finished not too long ago, I guess, a couple of years now, um, you know, still know quite a few of the playing squad. And, you know, it's nice to see them and have a chat. And, um, see how they're getting on so that's that's quite nice to still have sort of one foot in the door I guess um, it's also nice to be away and doing stuff other uh, in other environments but um, yeah it's nice to still be in around there uh, yeah in terms of my dad he was a massive part of my um, growing up uh, he was a cricketer played decent low level uh, club cricket uh, he grew up with Alan Elam in sort of the Ashford area um, played for Ashford um, with Alan as a as a young man. Um, he was a slow bowler. He also played semi-pro football for Folkestone in the Southern League. Um, hence why Dominic's asked the question because he was one of his um, one of his players when he ran the reserve team down there. So yeah, he was a massive part of my um, cricketing sort of formation, I guess, and the way I go about um, playing sport and um, hopefully doing it in the right way, really. He was, he was big on that, on the moral side of things and um, doing things in the right manner. And I like to think that that sort of rubbed off. So, you know, not necessarily so much about how to play the game of cricket because he tended to leave me to my own devices, didn't want to sort of budge in too much. But um, certainly the other stuff of how sort of conduct yourself and that kind of stuff was massive and um, a big influence on me. All right, time's nearly up here, so it's um, the final question time. You've got to get down the fire station on your jersey. So, um, last question for all of you here. Um, set, the question said, what was it like receiving your county cap? Do you remember the honour I see that you're wearing your Ken, 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 uh, Ken cap here? What was the honour like? Is it, does it still mean that, do you think, to county players these days? I hope so, you know, because it's something that, you know, it takes takes a lot of effort to to, to earn. Um, you know the the work that you have to go through. So, you know, I we used to. I'm not sure if it's still the same, but we uh, I think they've moved them. But we would always sit to have lunch and be surrounded by capped players. Of you know, you could go and you'd walk around and you'd have a look at the the photos from from the eras gone by. And and for me, it was a a real honour to to think right. I'm gonna, I'm up on that wall, and you know they did them in banks of three. So you look, see who was capped at a similar time, and you know and again, we've got some absolute legends that have played for us. You know, and me being a wicketkeeper, you know the fact of being a cap player at the same place that Alan Knott played. You know that's to you know the, arguably the greatest ever wicketkeeper. So to, to me, it was a huge amount of pride, uh, as you can see. I love the fact that it's you know it still fit uh, and the little touches that they do now with with what number you are. So um, so yeah, I, I'd like to think I hope the youngsters have got a a real perspective of of what it means to to be able to put the put the horse on uh, and wear it. Uh, for me, I, I echo all of that. Um, having been a you know grown up in the county, so always sort of had that affiliation with Kent Cricket and to see the names that have gone before and to follow in, in some of the footsteps and be awarded a cap, um, you know, is right up there with the winning of the trophies, really. Like I say, it goes through different phases of your career. You make your debut, you, you get your cap. Um, and that's probably the 
if you don't win any trophies after that, then that's probably the one that really sits in your memory for um, the real long, long time. So, yeah, it's a hugely proud, proud thing to have received that. I think um, for me, it's, it's just it just shows that you've contributed so much to an individual county. And it, it, it was always a personal goal of mine to try and get my cap. Um, you know, having already been, been released from one county, you know, it was sort of to have that second chance and that second opportunity and, and to, to, to do it for Kent, who's got such a long tradition of great cricketers, you know, and just be, be included within that sort of lineup. And it is a special moment when you do receive your cap. And it's something that they, they do keep it from you. They don't tell you you're going to get it. So, you know, you're almost caught unawares. And so when you do get it, it's, it's certainly, you know, an honour. And I hope, I, as Jonas says, you know, the, the guys coming through now, um, the younger guys, hopefully they appreciate how much it means to, to get that cap and to, to supporters that, that recognise what the players have done for the county.